This is Michael Cowan, and welcome to Trial Lawyer Nation. You need to show people the worst possible harm that that negligence could have caused, because that's what the case is about. What I'm asking you to do is to focus on what you can control, because that's where the power lies. The Dalai Lama uh, has a saying that in the face of anger, justice evaporates. If you can't focus group it, you have to be very, very critical of your process. The facts aren't good, you can't create a miracle. We can agree to disagree and be zealous advocates for our clients. Quit worrying about looking perfect. You're not going to. That'll come in time, but you can still be an effective litigator. Welcome to the award-winning podcast, Trial Lawyer Nation, your source to win bigger verdicts, get more cases, and manage your law firm. And now, here's your host, noteworthy author, sought-after speaker, and renowned trial lawyer, Michael Cowan. Today on Trial Lawyer Nation, uh, we've got Rich Newsome, a great lawyer from Orlando, Florida, someone I've known for a long time. How are you doing today, Rich? Good, my friend. Great to see you. Well, thank you for joining us. It's always good. You know, one my biggest uh, criteria for selecting guests for Trial Lawyer Nation is a selfish one. I like, who do I want to learn from? Uh, how can, you know, what guests can I have that are going to better my practice? And some of the stuff you're doing is really exciting, uh, and I've had a chance to talk to you about it some, but I really want to talk about it more, and I'm really excited to have you on. Uh, so tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, I, I'm a Florida native. Uh, went to uh, FSU undergrad in Florida Law School, which makes me a schizophrenic. Uh, but uh, at least now with my Knowles losing, I can have some solace in the Gators' uh, victories. But I um, mean, yeah, I went to law school, was a federal prosecutor with the U.S. Attorney's Office, and then rolled out, was a big civil defense firm representing uh, product manufacturers in catastrophic cases. We were kind of the, uh, was with a guy that Ford Motor Company would parachute in on some of the bigger cases. And then eventually had enough of that and left. And I've been doing uh, plaintiff's work for the last 25 years. And, uh, 20 years, and, yeah. and doing it pretty, pretty well. You've had a lot of big verdicts, a lot of big settlements. Uh, you've also started something, I want to go into the details later, but something called trial school. Just, a, just to kind of tease us, what is trial school? Yeah, so trial school is a collaboration of a group of lawyers, uh, really good lawyers across the country to share method. And it started out really as a laboratory uh, on voir dire, and then it kind of grew from there into trying to explore. We found there was all these little bits and pieces of beautiful method that uh, could be combined into maybe forming a better way of trying cases. And so that was the genesis. And now it's this giant online platform. We have a really good community of lawyers, both faculty and members to collaborate and try to make each other better for trying cases. And that's awesome. And I, and I so appreciate you doing that too. Uh, but before we get into that, I kind of want to talk a little bit about, you know, your background and some of, you know, your successes and struggles that, that, that led to this. Uh, so first of all, you said, you know, you started off at the U.S. Attorney's Office, you started off at uh, a defense firm. It's kind of the traditional path. You know, when you go to law school, it feels like there's this pressure that, oh, success is working in the corporate world, working right. in the government, and, you know, we're kind of pariahs in the plaintiff's world. It's almost like, oh, those are for the C students. And uh, <laughs> what, what caused you to uh, to switch sides? Well, you know, I, I was with this great firm, and, and they had some really wonderful resources, and I was representing uh, a manufacturer in a case where a family had lost a two-year-old when it was an huh. alleged defective seatbelt case. And... Uh, I was taking the deposition of the family and my wife, meanwhile, was pregnant with our first child. We were trying to build a house. We had student loans um, and I'm taking this family. And I just felt, I mean, it was a good lawyer on the other side, but we were completely outgunning him due to resources. And, you know, here I am representing Ford. I just felt, I mean, it was, it was horrible. You know, the client or the, the client, the family was crying. I was trying to hold back tears. It was just awful. I called my wife on the way home. I said, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. So to her credit, you know, we were in debt with student loans and she said, OK. And I took a huge cut in pay and left uh, left the big defense firm and joined a small practitioner and just started knocking on doors and saying, hey, let me sue these uh, car companies. Let me sue these tire companies uh, and represent people. And is that where you started and it was in the product world? Yeah. I mean, so that's what I knew. I mean, I, I knew products at that point. And so started knocking on doors of other friends who were plaintiff lawyers. I didn't know a lot at the time, which actually John Morgan was one of the first guys that said, Hey man, look, why don't you handle our product cases? And he was a good friend of me and helping me get started. And, but that's been my, my, uh, for the last 20 years, uh, it's mainly 
working with other plaintiff firms to co-counsel cases where they have a defective product case, sometimes in tandem with another. But yeah, so it's been rewarding for, for me to get to know the community and you know, my entire business model is built on working with not just other lawyers, but other plaintiff lawyers. So it's been, you know, I, I just, I love the community. And so it's really been a, a rewarding experience, both to represent the clients and to, to work with my friends. It, it is, it is fun uh, when you get to go counsel with other lawyers. And uh, now the product world is, uh, it's hard and easy to get into. I mean, I, I used to do a lot of product work. On one hand, it's easier to get people to give you cases that cost hundreds of thousands of, of, of dollars to do and and where if you do a perfect job, you still probably have, you know, no more than a 50, 50 percent chance of winning a trial because it's easier to blame a driver than it is to blame right. a car. Right. Uh, but on the other hand, the 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 learning curve and the cost to to, you know, work up a case uh, are so high. I mean, how did you. How did you get there? I mean, how did you how did you get there financially to be able to fund these cases? How did you get there to, to discern what's a good case and what's not? Yeah, so so I because I, I jumped to the plaintiff side and started I joined this other guy. This is the mid '90s, and this is a, an old school plaintiff lawyer who had been very very successful. A guy's name was John Overchuck, had a wonderful reputation, was involved in the AIEG, and he had done. I was attracted to him. He had done a lot of the early Bronco II litigation and a lot of the Jeep litigation. So he, and he had also obviously been very, very successful. And so I started really with his help uh, and started trying cases with him and got plugged in. You know, the, the auto manufacturers say, you know, certain, I remember when I was on the defense side, oh, well, he's plugged in or he's not plugged in. Was, what does that mean? You know, there is a group of, of product liability plaintiff lawyers across the country sort of within and surrounding this group called the AIEG, which is the most amazing group of lawyers. They all share information freely and made it where a young lawyer like me could come in and get up to speed. They share experts, they share information. So that was really what it was, partnering with an older lawyer who wanted to you know, bring me in and also getting plugged into other plaintiff lawyers. I mean, my entire practice, both co-counsel and working has been through, I think that's you and how you and I got to know each other years yeah. ago. Uh, we met by, by this wonderful uh, network of lawyers across the country that work together to help help each other with their cases. So that's how I did it. And it is such an incredible network. And, and anyone that's thinking about doing a, a, a product case should join AIEG. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll, I'll say this, that if you don't join AIEG it's, it's, and you're doing an auto product case, even in any product case, it's borderline malpractice. The other thing too is any young lawyer, and I, I, I would hugely emphasize this, if I could make one point today, any young lawyer who wants to get into product liability can do it because the community of lawyers who do, I mean, got great lawyers like Don Slavic, um, great lawyers like Jim Gilbert uh, and, and, you know, Rob Palmer, these lawyers, Chris Spagnoli have really made it where you can plug in. They will share with you freely. As long as you're willing to put in the elbow grease, um, you can do these cases. Yeah. I remember my first, seat back defect case. I was able to send requests for production saying, you know, to General Motors, I want this document by name. I want this right. document by name, you know, that was authored by this person on this date. And, you know, one, it lets them know from the beginning this person's done their homework, but two, you, you know, you've saved uh, countless uh, hours uh, in heartache trying to sort through what's there. You know, the, I've had people say, oh, it's so expensive to join the IAC. It's like $2,000. Well, just the money you save, not, not <laughs> hiring an expert you don't need or are, right. are, you know, not having to do all this extra work, it pays for itself very quickly. But what really shocked me in that, you know, and it's, you know, when I was up and coming and trying to get in the product world, I had an F-150 rollover case. Uh, Michael Watts, who practiced, you know, he lived two hours away from me, he practiced in the same community, you know, honestly, going after the same referral lawyers, uh, had tried and won uh, an F-150 rollover case, you know, same platform, these other same kind of model years, same basic vehicle. Uh, and, you know, so I call him and he just has his office, you know, pull out the file. Let's me go yep. through, copy all the best exhibits, you know, get this trial transcript. Doesn't charge me a dime, doesn't ask for anything. Uh, just incredible. Whereas, you know, a lot of people in other industries would say, well, I, I want to shut out the competition. Whereas there's such an abundance mentality. In the, you know, there's plenty of work for everybody. Let's help each other. Uh, it's it's a great way. And I think that's really when we get into the trial school stuff carried over. Uh, into what you're doing with trial school, what Joe Freed, who also came from that product world, is doing, yep. uh, and, and Michael Lieserman are doing with the ATAA and the trucking world. 
Uh, it's just such a great time to be a plaintiff's lawyer because that that spirit of helping each other is really spreading. Uh, whereas, you know, when you and I started outside the product world, that spirit wasn't always present. You're right. You're absolutely right. Yeah, I really think that AIG did a lot to, at least for those of us, guys like Joe Freed, you, uh, Michael Watt. Michael did the same thing with me when I was, I just jumped over. Uh, Tab Turner did too. They These guys open up their doors in the same experience as you. It's actually how I met Kale Conley. We actually met at Watts's office going through his oh, documents wow. back in the Firestone days. And uh, Michael uh, Watts could not have been more generous. So Now, the one thing I wish I had done in, in if I wanted to get in the product field in, in retrospect was working for a lawyer that had the capital and had the experience uh, yeah. because the, you know, trying to make enough money to fund a product case. And then we'd, I, I remember I had a partnership breakup because I was just getting into products and we had settled two, our first two seven figure cases and we didn't take a distribution as partners because all the money was going to fund the other cases. And, and, and frankly, to get out of the debt, uh, and uh, pass through bills that we had accumulated working up the other cases. Uh, and it was always like, can we settle something in time for my expert disclosures on this other case? Uh, it was scary. And, you know, in retrospect, and actually that's when my pra practice took off because I, when that partnership broke up, uh, I couldn't do the, the buyout and fund my cases. So I went to work for a guy named Rob Ammons, who's a great lawyer. Oh, Houston, that's right. For a couple years. <laughs> and, you, know, yeah, you did a lot of products with Ammons. He's one of the greats. Good yeah, and that was really what the uh, – financially, that was a huge turning point for me. I mean, the uh, you know being able to get out of the hole and then learning from someone who ran a successful practice, okay, these, this is how you pick cases. This is how you can right. work with your experts in a way that doesn't leave, leave you some money and your clients some money left at the end. <laughs> That's of the right. Uh, you know, here's how – you know, just – it was – I learned so much working with him. Um, well, and the other the other advantage of working with a with a, an experienced lawyer, and this goes for any practice, especially a niche practice like medical malpractice or product liability or mass torts, whatever it is. But it's in case selection, knowing yeah. which case to get into. If you're a mass tort, knowing which pro, pro, projects to take a pass on. And with products, I think that was maybe the most valuable lesson my mentor taught me was, you know, as he once said, this is John, a guy named John Overchuck. He he said that. Uh, we make more money as plaintiff lawyers in the cases we turn down than the ones we take. And I think with product liability, that's so much of it is knowing which ones to turn down. Yeah, I started off representing, you know, I, I took some cases where the, you know, the man who died was driving, was intoxicated, was not wearing a seatbelt. And frankly, I'm lucky that I escaped without a bankruptcy, right. a personal bankruptcy. I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, know. that, that which does not kill us makes us stronger. I mean, I, you know, you, you you take credit in your own brain for your wins, but boy, you really lose from your uh, learn from your losses. And I, I agree. I couldn't agree with that more. Yeah. Although I'm kind of tired of learning at this point, but that, that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, though, uh, I, I still keep getting the hard lessons, it seems sometimes. It happens. So yeah. for those people that are going to, you know, think about doing product cases, what what is it in your mind that, that makes a good product case? Yeah. So at the end of the day, because as you said, Michael, these things are really expensive. And I think you can't really try a product case for less than half a million dollars today. They're really, you know, especially if it's getting into an airbag case, for example, or a seatbelt case or something that, you know, God forbid, it's a, a vehicle, um, uh, autonomous vehicle issue or something in the electronics, it's a million dollars or more. Uh, we had, you know, right around a million bucks the last, last one we tried before COVID. And, you know, it's just enough to make you want to vomit if you stop and think about it. So number one, because of the costs, you have to have a catastrophic injury. Um, if a client, I remember a friend of mine is a plaintiff lawyer is a little, um, you know, but it's right out there. He said, look, you know, we can't take a case if the client is walking and talking. So yeah. you have to really have a wrongful death case. You have to have serious injury, a paralysis, brain injury, loss of a limb to justify it because otherwise the damages won't be, you win a verdict and it's just not enough to offset the cost. So that's number one. And then I think number two, it has to, you know, even though some jurisdictions don't no longer have the consumer expectations test for years, that was the jurisprudence of the country when it came to defective products. It's that the definition of strict liability or defect is when a, a product fails to act or perform in the manner that an ordinary consumer would expect. 
We still have that. I think Texas may still have it. Some other case uh, states. Yeah, we're safe for current design, Texas. Yeah, you are okay. Well, but but even yeah. even even if it may not be the standard in a lot of states, post tort reform or post jurisprudence, judges making bad you know conservative judges making bad decisions, it still comes down to that same idea: is that if you look at a fact pattern, I always say you know take the pictures of a crash if it's an auto case, for example, a crash word in this case, and show that to a group of lay people that will be on the jury. And you ask, hey, do you think someone should have been seriously hurt or killed in this crash? And if they say no, then that's a product case. Or take a fact pattern and say, look, here's what happened being objective. Do you think this product should have performed in the way it did or not performed in the way it did? And if the answer is that, yes, that product shouldn't have done that or should have protected, that's the case. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very fundamental level. A, a common sense analysis, does this fact pattern rub me the wrong way? Yeah. And if so, did it then cause a catastrophic injury? That's that's the core to me of the product liability case. Yeah, I think some of the hard the hard things or some of the cases I picked uh, when I was doing products uh, is I didn't have a good compared to what. And sometimes you don't. You know, let's say when we were um, early, like in the mid 90s in, in roof crush litigation. I mean, yep. it was horrible. They were making these weak roofs. You know, vehicles would roll over, paralyze people, kill people, and, and needlessly. But you didn't have a. But nobody was making a good roof. That's right. And so for until the Volvo XC90 came along, and then the Subaru Forester, and now lots of vehicles, you didn't have a good compared to what. So it's like if everyone is making it this way, and you're saying the whole industry should change, and every car that everyone's driving is defective. Now, if you can get somebody over that hump, they get really mad and want to help themselves. But it's really from a defensive attribution standpoint from the jurors, really hard to get past. No, you're right. And and some of the cases you really have to stretch. You know, we've, uh, I'm sure you did when, when you were doing a lot of product stuff, you get the oddball case. And sometimes the the answer to the puzzle to answer that is, is this out of the box research that you have to do. We had a trailer sway case years ago. And for the life of us, we couldn't figure out what happened. Then we finally figured out what happened, but turns out there was an alternative design. Now we found it. It was some little tiny company up in Michigan. Um, but yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I think that's part of the analysis, but even then, I mean, we were the community, some were winning roof crush cases back when they're really before the XC90, back when there were just a bunch of crappy roofs coming back to this notion that if you get a low speed rollover, where, you know, like, hey, here's you. I went off the side of the road for a good reason. I was dodging to avoid a kid and I went down a ditch and my vehicle rolled over and ended up on its roof. You know, that's that's clearly foreseeable. So, you know, and the, you can still win them, but boy, it becomes easier when you get an alternative design. It is. It, 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 they're not impossible, but they're harder. And so yes. it's, to me, a, a good compared to what. Right. When I'm looking when I'm looking now, like I, I recently had a, uh, a trailer underwrite case. So saying that the, the underwrite guard on the back of a trailer wasn't strong enough was our theory. You know, 15 years ago when they were all crap, those were hard cases. Yeah. Now that, you know, we had the Institute for Highway Safety had done testing and this particular company, you know, this company was an outlier. Most most companies by 20, the I think it was the 2018, 2019, whatever the model year was, were making ones that would have prevented this crash. And we were able to do testing with, a production vehicle, not something we had to create, and mm -hmm. show that there were there would only be minor injuries instead of a catastrophic brain injury. Uh, and in this one, they had actually created one that passed the test, got an award for it, and then never told anybody about it or tried to sell it. So we had really, <laughs> that's beautiful. We didn't, they didn't let us try it, but we had a really fun case. Uh, well, sometimes too, you know, there's other ways around it. Even there, if there's nothing in production, you can look at patents. Sometimes yeah. a lot of patent research. The other, I think, that's equally, if maybe not the most compelling evidence in any product liability case are other similar incidences. Right. There's a, we call them in AIG speak, OSIs. And if you can show, for example, that there was some easy fix, either with a patent or a recommendation, that was a, the case we tried you know, a year and a half ago with the E350. That particular was a van made by Ford Motor Company that had rolled over tons of times, killed a lot of people. They knew about it. They just decided to pay the claims. At least that was our, our theory at trial. Um, and, uh, you know, there was an alternative design that they just didn't do. And so sometimes by showing the number of times it's happened and knowledge by the company, and it obviously makes yeah. it foreseeable, you don't have to have, uh, no, we did. We had some other production vehicles, but there are ways around it. Look, it's this whole area, make no mistake, it is fraught with minefields because you've got 
the best trial lawyers on the other side, on the defense side coming in, they're going to be loaded to the teeth with, you know, they bring an army in the courtroom, six, seven lawyers. They usually take out a whole floor. You've been there, you know, the, yeah. the whole floor of the hotel room and they're coming with the best experts in the country. And here we are basically trying to tell a car company how to build a better car. Yeah, and it's yeah. just a, it's a little crazy if you think about it. But it's so important because look at all the advances we have in automotive safety yeah. because of litigation. I mean, we have stronger roofs. You know, our airbags aren't killing children anymore. Uh, yeah. At least not that I know of. Not like they were when they first came out. That's right. Uh, electronic stability control is standard on most cars, even before the government made them put it standard on most cars. Uh, seat belts are staying buckled more often during car crashes. I mean, just all yeah. kinds of great, great things. In fact, all the all the cases I learned how to do in the '90s are, aren't there anymore because they got tired of okay. suing them and they fixed the problems. It's so true. We had when I started um, a couple years into it. This is back when the whole Ford Firestone thing and vehicles were flipping over. You know, Chevys and Fords and Nissans. And we had a we we ended up having to get a warehouse um, mm -hmm. here in Central Florida just to store these evidence vehicles. And back then, the warehouse was literally filled to the brim with SUVs that had rolled over. Yeah. Today, I mean, I, I think maybe we got a couple van cases that are still rollovers, but it just doesn't happen anymore. And I think, I really believe that's a testament to the work that the crashworthiness bar across or the, the, the product liability bar across the country, the plaintiff's bar, is responsible for. I really believe that. That whole electronic stability control technology it's really miraculous. And it's the algorithm, as you know, that differentially fires the front and the rear tire and it's tied into the, it's just, it's miraculous and it saved lives. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great. And some, sometimes the most satisfying thing is the, the, the person that never met you and never knew what you, that you did it, you know, the life you saved right. uh, that they'll never know. That's right. But, but we see it in the data, which is kind of cool. And the fact that I know anecdotally vehicles, vehicles don't flip over and maybe the industry would have done it anyway, but, there sure was a financial hammer by a lot of great lawyers getting big verdicts and rollover cases to, 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 to make sure it happened. And, and I don't believe they would have done it without a re with, They just aren't going to dedicate the financial, the time and money to improving design if they don't have a reason to do it. Well, I think I you're mean, probably right. Yeah. Cause no one's when consumers, no one thinks they're going to get in the rack. And so they're not really thinking about it as much. There's some, there's some, but I mean, it, you know, and, and on the advanced stuff, like I said, if everyone's making the same roof, and the consumer doesn't have a choice, and they're just, what are they going to do? Well, not only that, but look at look at the litigation that's resulted in the the um, the light being turned on that that has revealed, I mean, some of the most important recalls in history. Look at Takata just recently. It was it was the yeah. result of a group of us that that had state court cases uh, that decided not to settle quickly and quietly like the manufacturers wanted to. That ended up bringing this thing to light, you know, Bill Nelson heard about it, um, got involved with some of us that had clients brought literally our, you know, it was Rob Ammons and my client, we brought it, brought us up to Washington and held Senate hearings and all of a sudden, boom, now we have the largest recall in history. Yeah. But I will, I know for sure that the timing of that never would have happened, but for a very small group of state plaintiff product liability lawyers following those airbag cases in state court. Yep. And it's, it's, you know, it's against, even though it's, you know, you could argue it's against your financial interest to do that, because if you're just looking at it from a pure financial point, let's like keep quietly settling these cases and keep the gravy train running. But that's not the right thing to do. Well, it philosophically goes into this thing you and I were talking about, about trying cases and, um, you know, the whole trial school idea is I think one of the great tragedies is that more cases aren't brought to trial, especially important ones and good ones where there's a public policy. I mean, it, there's such a temptation. Um, in the light of the money that it's going to cost to try it, the fear of these great lawyers coming in, defeating you and losing um, the fear of what's going to happen to your client. Um, but if you've got a client who's on board, uh, the difference between moving a case forward, getting the discovery, turning the light on uh, and, and getting a big verdict is just exponential in terms of the policy changes that can be affected by forcing corporations to change their behavior. And that, that applies not just to, product liability, but mass torts and, and antitrust and class actions. So, yeah. I, so I think, I think, yes, it's a huge temptation, but when, when lawyers decide to buckle down and try a case or at least get it ready and not capitulate, um, man, it makes all the difference. And we see that in case after case, I think over the, over the 
in the last 20 years that's resulted in not only safer products, but better behavior by corporations. Each year, the law firm of Callen Rodriguez Peacock pays millions of dollars in co-counsel fees to attorneys nationwide on trucking and company vehicle cases. If you have a case involving death or catastrophic injuries and would like to partner with our firm, please contact us. We have experience finding potential defendants that other firms miss, and we've added millions of dollars to cases by finding these sources of recovery. If you have a catastrophic injury or death case where the policy limits appear to be insufficient, give us a call. If we can find another defendant, we can partner on the case. And if we can't, then we won't ask for any of the fees. You can reach Delisi Friday by calling 210-941-1301 or send an email to podcast at triallawyernation.com. She will coordinate a time for Michael Cowan to speak with you in person or by phone to discuss the case in detail. And now, back to the show. Yeah, and, and it's crazy. You know, it really sucks to lose any case, and it sucks oh. even more when you have a lot of money invested in the case. But there's something liberating about, and it takes a while to realize it, but when you, I remember the first time I lost a case where I had $100,000, which at the time I met, a, I had a house that cost under $200,000. Uh, and then, you know, and I owed money on it. So, you know, the, the biggest, I guess the biggest investment I had in my whole life was that case that I had lost. Oh, it's uh, great. There's, there's nothing worse. I mean, I'm look, obviously losing a loved one or, you know, but short of, those types of issues professionally, it is the most devastating. And I, 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 I respectfully disagree because I survived. Yeah, well, you do. But when it happens, at least to me, it's not well, just your loss, you know, the ego, it's money to the firm, the loss yeah. of profit. But this poor client, you know, I think I was telling you about this case I lost up in the panel. But good God, it just yeah. it killed me, killed me. You know, that was a case there was no real offer. The client wouldn't got any money, and it was liberating at the end of the day. It sucked when I went through it, but then when I'm going through trial the next time, and of course you're getting scared, but then you all say, well, if I lose, I'm not going to die. Right. That's true. I'm going to have another case. I'm going to have another trial. And realizing, I think that's part of the, people get paralyzed with the fear of loss, and they settle too cheap, and they don't try cases they need to try. Yep. And I think that part of the survival practice of, you go, you go, you survive it. It really sucks. You don't want to do it again, so you work harder. But you also realize it's survivable. It's not going to kill me. You're right. That is the absolute truth. And 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 sometimes though, that realization takes time. Yeah. Uh, and and I also really believe this that when you take a big loss like this, uh, like I did, uh, and we all have, um, it makes it forces you to learn lessons and to improve your game. I think. Uh, yeah. I'd like, to talk, I'd like to talk about uh, a, a story of a, a big loss, something you did to develop. We talked about this, develop yourself, and then a big win. So you had a big loss that really bothered you. Uh, yeah, that is what I was talking about. So there's this case up in a very conservative jurisdiction in Florida, Florida Panhandle, and there was, it was a 19-year-old paraplegic. And it had to do with a, an alleged steering defect. And... Um, I had I had been on a roll. I'd won a lot of verdicts at that point, and I rolled in just so cocky. And I I picked the jury. The I actually I actually hired Jay Burke. Jay Burke is you know is this famous jury consultant who actually came up with what he called the causes king method that Keith Mitnick talks about in his book. And Keith gives Jay credit. It's a method. Basically, it's the basic algorithm Mitnick uses that uh, other great lawyers, uh, Chris Searcy, um, Willie Gary, Steve Yared. This guy really changed the way we picked juries in Florida, affected the jurisprudence. And so I hired Jay on this case. I'd worked with him before. And man, it, it was a two-day voir dire. And I did it exactly like Jay wanted me to. But I felt disconnected from the jury at the end. And I also obviously made a lot of mistakes in picking the jury. I, I went against my, well, I just picked a bad jury. And when I lost, it was just what did I do wrong? And for, it was several years that I really questioned, you know, I felt like something was missing in my practice that uh, ultimately forced me to continue to learn and try to develop my voir dire to the degree where I think I, I now know what I did and I wouldn't have lost that case if I had to try it again. So what did you do to, to learn? So there's a, a great lawyer out of uh, Jackson, Wyoming uh, named uh, Mel Orchard who's the managing partner of the Spence Law Firm. And Mel and I had become friends through a group, group called the Summit Council. Uh, and Mel had done a presentation. He brought some, some of the members of his firm to a Summit Council meeting and demonstrated this tribe building method. And the tribe building method is a way of picking juries. It was developed by Jerry Spence, of course. 
um, who is the founder of the Trial Lawyers College, which is this amazing uh, school. But they teach a very different method. You know, in Florida, Jay Burke taught causes king, get everybody kicked off. Uh, who who are you know just get them get the members get the jury to basically admit that they're biased. And Spence's approach of trial building is completely the opposite. He said, you know, Spence says that the agenda should be to not exercise any challenges for cause, not to kick anyone off and to have this conversation with the jury about the case and to have you participate in that community such that at the end you've formed a tribe and you're a part of it and completely opposite. Um, and so that was just really eye opening to me. And I, so I went to the college, Mel, Mel convinced me to go. And I went there for three weeks. I was exposed to this method. And I was talking to a guy named Joey Lowe, who is one of Spence's you know, main faculty members. And I talked to him. I said, you know, we do this thing in Florida. It's very different. It's called you know, Causes King. And Joey's like, yeah, that's bullshit. I'm like, no, dude, it's really, it's really not. I mean, there's some really amazing lawyers who have used this. And so I came back to Florida after the, I graduated from the college and learned this thing. And I took Mitnick. I was at lunch with Keith Mitnick, who is here in Orlando. Keith's a good friend. And you know, I was telling him, I said, man, you're not going to believe this thing they do. It's tribe building and they, they don't try to get any challenges for cause. And Mitnick's like, oh, that's bullshit. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> it can't both be bullshit. So yeah. we, I said, how about we do this laboratory? And so we had some of the best, some of the top guys from uh, TLC, Trailers College, Joey Kame, Johnny Zelps, Mel Orchard. We had uh, Keith Metnick, the great Alex Alvarez from Miami. We had uh, Brian McLean from Morgan & Morgan. We had some other really good sort of causes King guys. And we mashed up focus groups over three days and we talked about method. And at the end, there's about 30 lawyers who came from around the country. Johnny Carpenter came from uh, with Nick Rowley's firm. And it was really, uh, Ken Suggs was there. Anyway, it was really eye opening, And we started to talk about what we call the hybrid uh, approach to voir dire, where you take some of these other methods. And then there were other methods. Jim, uh, Jim Purdue Jr. from Texas talks about, you know, they have a very different way. They have a scoring method that they use. Yeah. Uh, some of the stuff from Lisa Blue. And so we started, a, you know, started this conversation and this exercise. We just started calling it trial school sort of as a shorthand. Hey, let's do the trial school. And then we started live streaming with each other. And then we started having, you know, we, we held a big retreat where a bunch of us got together in Arizona. So this thing had been going on a while and then COVID hits. And we thought, well, heck, why don't we just start to build a library? Because what we found is that there are so many young lawyers that needed this information. But for me, it was an exercise that helped me understand that there are more than one ways to pick a jury. There are different methods that can complement each other. And it really, to me, solved my problem that I had that I felt that hit me, you know, in the head, in the panhandle, uh, a way of dealing with conservative jurors to have them not hate you to in fact, make, build a tribe, but still with integrity and honesty, have the jurors basically admit that, yes, maybe this isn't the case for me. And so was, I think we've come to have an understanding of a better way of, of picking juries. We'll call it mixed method advocacy. It's kind of like, you know, in the octagon, you know, you have to know how to shoot, you know, grapple. You have to know how to kick. You have to know how to strike. Today, I think that the best methods of picking juries utilize all these different approaches. Um, and there's a bunch of stuff. You know, Kelly and you still develop some really uh, powerful uh, methods of evaluating juries through research. And so anyway, that's my story of, of, of my personal growth. I took that loss and I, I really feel like I've gotten better. And I tried a case last year, well, it was several, actually, I started picking juries for, for friends just for free to test some of the stuff. And I really do feel like, at least for me, I've, I've found a better way to conduct a one year. I kind of have two observations on that. One is just the, what continually amazes me when I get to talk to people like you, they're, you know, on the upper echelon of successful trial lawyers is the constant dedication to learning new things. I mean, at at that point in your career, just a few years ago, spending three weeks to go to the trial lawyers college. Uh, whereas, you know, I've talked to a lot of people that already know how to do this. And the people that are at the top are constantly trying to learn new things. Uh, the other is, I think one really liberating thing is there's always, and, and, I, and I felt prey to some of it um, when I was younger, like, okay, there's a way to do this. And this person is a master and a right. guru and they're right on everything. And so I have to do exactly what they say. And if I lose, it's because I didn't follow their method enough because they have all the answers. Yep. And the realization that one, no one has all the answers. Uh, and then two, you know, I do have the freedom to, to be me, to pick and choose and find out what works for me. 
because uh, I'll be honest, when I do a, a pure for cause strike, I mm-hmm. can get a bunch of people off for cause, but I feel like this gap. I feel like I've created this atmosphere of, yeah, okay, I've got this really borderline kind of bullshit case, but on a technicality, I should win because, I, you know, more likely than not, my client was probably hurt and it was probably the defendant's fault. So, right. You know, lost some money. And then we, I and get then, it. And then when I go put on this great case, I've already created this bad atmosphere. Whereas when I go in and do more of a tribe building thing, the people that are bad for me are still identifying themselves. Right. But we're just doing it in a different way. Uh, and so, you know, I was so excited to hear what you were doing because it's kind of what I've been. I went to the trial lawyers college in 98. Uh, nice. Yeah. You know, I did the opposite. I was, you know, I, I had only tried three or four cases when I went and I was having a little fender benders and Cairo only cases. Uh, and Joey Lowe actually was still a, an intellectual property lawyer <laughs> right. getting ready to leave and start doing trial work and decided to go, gotten into the trial lawyers college. Uh, he was in my class. Uh, so it's just no, funny. You, know. you were there at the beginning, man. That was uh, well, in the I early was, days. Uh, fifth year. Uh, my, my first boss I went to work with was in the original class. And that's actually. Who was that? Who was your. A guy named Ed Stapleton. Um, oh, I've heard that. Sure. Yeah. yeah his, his, I was at a huge firm in New York City. I was thinking about moving home. Mainly because the woman I'm now married to was living in, in Brownsville, Texas, uh, and very conservative upbringing, was still living with her parents and was not going to go move to New York City with some guy uh, <laughs> she wasn't married to. And we weren't. I was in love, but we had not been. I mean, we'd been dating six weeks before I moved to New York City. This is as stupid as that sounds. And, uh, so I was talking to some insurance defense firms and I was talking to a federal judge I knew and he recommended I talk to Ed, not even to get a job, but to get an idea of what defense firms were doing a good job in state court. Uh, and Ed just says, we well, should work for me for three reasons. Uh, I'll teach you how to try a case so those fuckers don't know how to try one. Uh, I'll let you try cases and they won't, no matter what they tell you. And I'll send you the Jerry Spence trial lawyer's college. Oh, and you can man. Get work. Wow. What a gift. What a gift. So, you know, it was that's the like, that's paying. like the golden trio of, of oh, yeah. how few it was the lowest fun. paying job offer. It was, uh, you know, it was just a little bit more than half of what I was making in New York, but it was also considerably lower than what the defense firms were making or were, were offering me. Although three years later, you know, I was doing much better. Um, but it was just, uh, what a gift though. I mean, it was a gift and it was a good way to start, but, yeah. but then I had the, you know, you had, I had to be Jerry Spence. I had to, I had to do things like Jerry Spence. I'd use arguments to Jerry Spence work. And there are things that work very well for Jerry Spence that don't work for Michael Cowan. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, so I'm a mere mortal. I'm not Jerry Spence. Yeah, I'm not me too. Mark Lanier, and I'm not Keith Mitnick. You know, I still get, you know, performance anxiety. I get eaten up, you know, with stress the night before when I'm getting ready. I, I'm just, I'm an everyday guy. And when <clears throat> I think one of my criticisms of traditional CLE programs, you know, there's, first of all, sort of the, the traditional go to the big, you know, state or national trial lawyers group, and it's whoever shows up. There's no unified curriculum or method. I mean, you have one right. guy and they don't sort of tie it together. The other is you go to a program like TLC, which is great as it is, as you said, is very dogmatic. It is our way or the highway. Right, and that's right. just, to me, that that doesn't bear truth in my experience. There are, and so that's one of the things sort of this collective of, of lawyers around the country started. It's like, let's curate method. And at least present it in this this MMA approach. And you may take some or all of it or none of it. But one of the things we've discovered, and this has been, it's just unfricking believable, is that as we've been going down this path, new nuggets keep popping up, like really good shit. Like, you know, last year um, I went up and I'd heard somebody talking about, yeah, Freed's trying cases faster. So I called Joe. I'm like, hey, man, what are you doing? He goes, ah, I'm just trying to figure out how to win it down. So I went up. We did a whole program I'm like, dude, this is speed trial. And we gave it a name, but it's a method of trying cases faster. There is a, we were doing a presentation literally two months ago with Mike Papantonio and Troy Rafferty. You know, they do a lot of these big mass tort cases. I'm like, yeah, and we use our theme grid. And I'm like, oh, wait, what? Yeah, you know, we build a theme grid. I'm like, what the heck is a theme grid? Yeah. And I, there are this thing we came up with like five years ago that we use and he rolls it out. And it's like this giant like poster board <laughs> laminated with like rows. And it is the most brilliant tool for deposition and cross. And so that's a new nugget. We had Kozarowski, you know, just last week talking about the, this idea of a foundation depot that he does. It's brand yeah. new shit. And so that's to me, and I could go on and on and on and on and on. And to me, that's been what's great is that 
this has really become a laboratory that for me has been so stinking rewarding because it's made me better. And I'm hoping it's going to make a lot of us better by sharing information. Sure. And it's just it's just incredible that these these people that are so successful that have developed these incredible tools for their own practice are just freely sharing them. Yeah. Well, and that's the idea behind trial school. You know, unlike having to pay five thousand dollars to go to Atlanta, you know, and hear about a method, you know, or even pay, you know, a thousand dollars to go to an AAJ meeting in Vegas to learn how to take depositions and stay in the hotel room and four days on an airplane. This is all free. You know, trial school, we decided to make it completely not for profit, completely transparent. And it will always, always, always be free for every lawyer because, you know, to the, the lawyers that need it the most, the baby lawyers, the guys like, you know, you and I, when we were getting started, we don't have the money to, to pay. And if you do, it's a sacrifice. You yeah. can't take a week out of your practice. And then if you do, you're forgetting it when you need it two months later. Yeah. So this is a, a way it's kind of like master class where you can just ring up, you know, how to you know, how to learn to cook with Wolfgang Puck. You can pull it up on your phone. So the idea is that we're making it easy to access, completely free and useful in the fog of battle where you don't have time to read, go back and read balls on damages and to read Mitnick and to read Reptile and all the stuff. You can literally get a template, a checklist, watch John Gomez give an opening for 45 minutes and use it. Now it's better, obviously, if you use your own methods, but, um, it's, it's made me better, and I think it's going to help a lot of folks uh, as a vehicle. And I just want to repeat that. You said it's totally free. People don't have to pay any money at all. No. To- yeah. Yeah, that's that's the game changer for this. It's always – we do the live streams free. The library's free. It will is and will always, always, always be free for our members. The only difference is we have a rigorous – again, we stole from an AIEG idea. You'll remember that if you join AIEG, you're getting all these documents, all this great information, the secret stuff from the great – but you have to sign an NDA, not non-disclosure agreement, and a joint prosecution agreement with your bar number and sign an affidavit saying that you only do plaintiff's work. You do not represent any businesses or corporations, and you will, on your blood oath, not share it. And so, yeah. look, it's not perfect, but it's been a model that's worked for AIEG for a long time, and so we incorporated that in the trial school. So if you're a lawyer who only represents people, you, you've got to get two references. You sign the affidavit. We vet you. We actually have found defense lawyers trying to sneak in. But once you're in, man, you're part of the club. And it's that all is, free till the dawn of time. That is so awesome. And I, I can only imagine the amount of uh, not just money, but time and effort you've put into this and the value that, you know, the money you could have made had you chosen to work on one more catastrophic case instead of doing all that. And I think we we all owe you an, an incredible debt of gratitude. And, uh, well, it's it's been a group. You know, there's been a group of us. Who, it's not just me. It was Andrew Finkelstein who's put, you know, full-time staff on it. There's Kelly and Eustel. There's John Gomez. There's Purdue. You know, Mike Kelly, Troy. A lot of firms have kind of chipped in on this. And, you know, it's uh, it's really been a group effort. That's awesome. Uh, could you give me an example? Then you had a recent success. Uh, you know, I, I want to bring the full circle. So you had the you you had a case that didn't go your way, and a nineteen yeah. year old paraplegic is incredibly painful. Uh, you've had your journey of discovery, where you're, you're learning new things and really you know throwing yourself in uh, to learn new things and and re- change your approach. And now let's talk about how you applied it. Yeah. So, so it was another, like that case in the panhandle 10 years ago, I had this case. It was a really conservative jurisdiction on the West coast of Florida. A lot of retirees, a lot of engineers, people from sort of the Midwest, very, very red Trump County. Um, Never really any big, we had a wrongful death case. So that was a problem. You know, a lot of these conservative jurisdictions, they won't put big money on a wrongful death case. And we had like oodles of comparative fault. We had, couple defendants that we had made a conscious decision to settle with. It was a recalled tire. We'd settled with Michelin. It was a tire that had been in for servicing and they missed the recall at, at Sam's club. We'd settled with Sam's club. We were left with Ford motor company for a van that had a design defect that made it flip over, which is a strong theory, but, but a heck of a lot more tenuous than a recalled tire. And we're trying to blame the church for not maintaining their seatbelts properly, which was another, and, Blaming Ford for having a, a bad seatbelt design that allowed it to fall through the cracks. So all these issues, I mean, literally a swirling toilet bowl of liability. And the easy thing for the defense is to blame the, the parties that had already checked out. Yeah. So because of that, um, you know, it was a tough case. I thought it was going to come down to the jury and to voir dire. And I was able to take 
these, and I, by the way, since this trial school thing started, I was picking juries for free sometimes for other firms just to try to explore some of these new methods and this different way of doing things. And so I did it. It was a two day voir dire. We brought in 200 jurors over in conservative Pasco County. And, uh, we, we got it. What I thought was a fair jury, uh, at the end of that process. And after a, you know, three and a half, four week trial, we got a really great verdict and, uh, man, it was just like, okay, all this stuff. And there were other pieces of the trial too, because we had started with voir dire, but it became more, you know, we're looking at demonstrative exhibits using metaphor more strongly, had a really powerfully used PowerPoint. We actually had, uh, uh, uh the guy who wrote the book beyond bullet points, Cliff Atkinson come to our retreat last year and teach us how to reconstruct PowerPoint, but everything, you know, you stealing some of Mark Lanier's great ideas on his use of metaphor, uh, the work by, um, you know, Dan Rome uh, with the back of the napkin Academy. So any of it, it was really great. It was a rewarding experience. And I really felt, okay, I learned and uh, grew and it was just rewarding just on so many levels. So, you yeah. said great verdict. What is a great verdict? It was, what, what? it was a, it was a $26 million wrong. It was the biggest verdict uh, in that County for a wrongful death case ever. And, and that's, so, that's a spectacular verdict. Uh, yeah. And, you know, we know it was there's comparative fault, you know, because the way we approached it again, based on some of these lessons is we owned everything. We embraced it and uh, we, we accepted responsibility for our own client, for all the other defendants. And but once you do that, you take the moral, at least in this case, we talked about shared responsibility. We use some metaphors and it really stole, stole the high ground, which I hadn't done 10 years ago. I played it a little bit differently. I you know, talked about comparative fault, but, um, but yeah, it was, um, it was a lot of lessons that, you know, I learned from having failed miserably 10 years before. And now knowing, looking back, uh, I really believe, and this is what breaks my heart, that had I been a better trial lawyer, had I known about some of the mistakes that I made, that the outcome would have been different. So that, that's the one case that will haunt me forever because that was, I believe it was my fault. I really do. So, but the good news is, I think at least now I'm a little, little uh, more aware of some of those problems. Yeah, and you know, the you can't, you 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 can't beat yourself up for not knowing then what you know now because no one else, no one else knew it either. <laughs> I mean, that's the fact. I mean, it's it's this is cutting edge stuff. Can you talk about some of the metaphor and what was the metaphor you used for shared responsibility? Yeah. So, so, you know, one of the things like Dan Rome talks about and uh, you know, Mike Kelly's a big proponent of uh, the great Mike Kelly from San Francisco about using metaphor. You know, we, 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 as, as people, we talk in metaphors, we talk visually. And so to the degree that you can change, you know, we talk in trial school, there are five spears, right? There's the self, which is the other giant grill in the groom room that you have to deal with your fear, your anxiety. And there's easy, not easy, but practical ways of conquering that, that we usually don't talk about in most trial advocacy programs, but there's that, there's the science, the big data, the focus groups that we can do now, it's changed everything. Uh, there is language, which is the traditional thing we focus on uh, that, you know, how to say things. Keith Mitnick, the, the great poet is the best on that. There is um, strategy, you know, order of proof, things like that. But then there's visuals. That's sort of the fifth spear. And metaphors to me are part of both the language and the visual component of, of a trial, but metaphor is the idea that we talk visually, we show them. For example, in this case, I talked about, look, members of the jury, there is, uh, we've talked about the rule that Ford Motor Company broke. We talked about the rules that the church broke, but there are other rules here. One of which is you have to wear a seatbelt. One of which is that if you know you're a tire manufacturer and you make a defective tire, you have to do an effective recall, whatever those rules were. And I said, and those are other rules that the defense is gonna talk about. And that's why this is a case of shared responsibility. And then I put a slide up that showed, I said, you know, so you've got, you know, the scales of justice. It was a picture of the scales. Everyone's familiar with that. I said, but this is a little bit different because there's so many parties. It's just not weighing one side or the other. And then I put up a, you know, like a supermarket scale with the big dial at the top where you stand on yeah. it and it has the needle. I said, it's more like this. And I said, you have to weigh the evidence and, and compare it between the various parties. And then I put up a series of like five scales, five supermarket scales. And I, and I crafted my, my opening and all the evidence around this idea that every single defendant and the plaintiff had to have their comparative fault weighed and compared to the other scales for the other defendants. And that was the metaphor that I used. There's other ones. 
um, that you can use as well. That was the one I chose in that case. And then at the end, I said, you know, and, and, and to do this weighing for each of the parties and each, and including the plaintiff for the shared responsibility, weighing this is a, is a form of measurement. How do we measure? We measure in terms of time and weight. So how much evidence is there and how long did each party have to make the decision or to, to take the action that they did or didn't take? And then, of course, you're able to show that with Ford, it was decades. With Michelin, it was years, you know, da 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 And of course, for the plaintiff, you know, it was seconds. And so that was the metaphor that I used there. But I really think that um, there's some really, the best, the best metaphor um, artist, I think, in the country is Lanier. You know, if you've yeah. ever watched any of his, uh, his stuff, you know, the, the one from the Viax trials, the first time I ever saw it, when he used all these great metaphors, uh, you know, telling the CSI story, for example, or the you know, the little figure that kicked the Vioxx uh, bottle off the cliff. Um, you know, but those are visual methods of storytelling Storytelling that if we just focus on language, I think without <clears throat> creating visual images with our words, but also showing visually using PowerPoint, using draw, you know, drawing pictures, um, it's, it's really uh, a huge loss for your ability to advocate and tell your story. So that's yeah. why the metaphor. I've really found doing focus groups and, and, and practice runs that I am not as clear and understandable as I thought I was. And without visuals, people, people just don't get me. Um, right. Well, and, and, you know, one of the things I, I love that Lanier has done is he will take every individual witness uh, and, and it looks you know, like he, you know, and, and craft a metaphor around them, yeah. you know, the, the puppet on the string, the, uh, the jukebox where you have to put in money, whatever it is. I mean, he's, I, I just am so blown. I think it's one of the reasons he's so successful with his verdicts is he's able to cull down these complex issues and the simplicity of a metaphor. Enjoying the episode? Do you wish you had Trial Lawyer Nation on the go? Well, wish no more. The Trial Lawyer Nation app is available now exclusively on iOS devices. Access our entire podcast library, create a favorites list, search for old and new episodes, and much more. It truly is Trial Lawyer Nation at your fingertips. Download this free app now and enjoy the top legal podcast for plaintiff attorneys wherever you go. And then uh, I want to go a little bit back to your, your jury selection of Wardire in that uh, big, case, big verdict. Can you just tell us a little bit more about what you did that was so successful in, in picking a, a good jury in a, in a rough place to try a case. Yeah. So I think, you know, it, it um, you know, the, the, the Jay Burke method is basically an algorithm for getting the jury to, to talk about fault or to talk about rather um, their negative feelings about certain things and then give a score and then get them to basically be candid and honest. That's half the equation. I think that the Spence half is about um, being uh, real and being candid as the attorney um, and, and, you know, showing your case warts, talking about them, honestly, talking about the, the weaknesses, you know, Spence calls them danger points and being brutally honest about the danger points. And um, I think, so for me, you know, the old days I used this sort of algorithm and today I think it's more important to have a conversation and try to direct the group to talk with each other before you get into this, the, the granular, you know, the uh -huh. way I used to do it, you're just starting out with the granular and you're left, at least for me, feeling very, and like you described in your case, you're feeling disconnected where they know what you're doing and they're pissed off. And so I think that this new way is, is you, you start by having this conversation honestly, and you're just a participant part of it. They're having the conversation with each other. And then after that's done, then you try to boil it down and combine the, the cost challenge algorithm afterwards. That's really good. I mean, I'm trying to do that myself. So I'm really I'm looking forward to I, I promised myself I'm not going to try anything new until I finish my book. And so um, I'm like, you know, you invited me to the trial school faculty. I want to participate. I want to I want to start taking the stuff. But I am also never going to finish this book if I don't just. Well, you, know, no, okay. you can't let you what, tell me about the book. I didn't. I didn't oh, know. No, I've got a trial guides contract to, to write a trucking a book on on trucking cases. So right. I'm really, it's Fantastic. really how to approach and, and not just uh, not just what the rules are, because I could have written that in a week. Uh, but <laughs> right. really, the, what I've been working on for a year and a half is, you know, I have a theory about what makes a villain uh, and right. a theory about story structure. And then how do we use the rules? How do we use industry standards to show that 
this is a, a company and, and these are high level people if we can find them at a company that are immoral, that are dishonest, that are putting other people in front of themselves, that are also that are powerful, that are intelligent, that, you know, the, the characteristics of the villain, how do we make a, a trial story that's going to motivate a juror to be the hero, uh, you know, following up on Carl Bettinger's uh, 12 oh. heroes, one, one, one voice. I, I, when is that coming out? I want to hear. I want to well, read. Probably late twenty one, early twenty two. By the time it comes okay. out. Uh, well, but if I ever should have. If ever you want to come and give us an hour or two overview on uh, on the trial school, you know we have every Friday. We have. I'd love yeah. to hear that. I, I will as soon as I finish the darn thing. But I, I've sworn <laughs> to myself I'm just because I what I have a a bright shiny object syndrome. I, I start on one thing and then I see I something else. I start on that and I start on that. So I've, I've just for discipline things until I finish the book. I'm not taking anything new on. Uh, well, good I luck. I can't, wait. I, can't, I can't wait to hear that. Or read yeah, it. I can't wait to get more involved too. Uh, I want to ask one more detailed thing about your trial, and then I want to go a little bit to trial school before we wrap up. Uh, yep. I could talk to you for all day, but unfortunately, we have a, a some time constraints in this format. Uh, you said there's some ways of conquering fear and anxiety, and that yes. is such a common thing uh, oh, that I see. Uh, tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, so actually, I think this spring we're going to do a whole series on it. It is, to me, the great elephant in the room that no one wants to talk about. And there are some, I was talking to Mitnick one time, I'm like, man, do you say, no, hell no, I don't get nervous. And I believe it, he doesn't. You know, he is the the, the consummate showman, and that's him, but I do. And I, I figured, well, if I do, you know, others do. So, you know, I think, though, that the good news is fear and anxiety is sort of like where other mental health issues were back in the 1950s. If you had depression, you can't talk about it. You can't. It's not acceptable. It's not cool. It's embarrassing. And I think that's where we as trial lawyers still are with fear and anxiety. You know, other industries that are performance, like, for example, concert uh, musicians or professional athletes or golfers, they have coaches to help with this stuff. And the good news is there are recognized, well-recognized solutions for, for, for this plague. Because when you're afraid, when you have performance anxiety, you can't be your best. You can't focus on connecting, having a conversation, being real, letting your real, you're just stilted uh, on, on every level. And sometimes to, the, to a degree where it's debilitating, uh, to the degree where it makes you settle a case that you shouldn't settle. So I think it is the biggest single thing. And if I can, I think have, if I could pick one piece of trial school that I think is the most important that we're going to teach more of going forward. It's our big spring, spring program. It's fear. We had, um, so, so at a very high level, there are, uh, I think, a few big solutions to this, and there's more. One is the simplest is beta blockers. Uh, we had Dr. Robert Goldstein um, do a whole presentation on this, but a lot of the fear symptoms that we fear is because, you know, it's this fight or flight uh, physiological thing where we get cotton mouth and, you know, sweating on the arm and you feel just, holy shit, you know? A beta blocker will make those physical symptoms drop out and it's not addictive. It doesn't affect your performance. It's basically, they use some of these for, for heart medicines, but yeah, Goldstein can talk about it. And I think that's the simplest cheat around it. Um, the number two, most important is batting practice, uh, which is what yeah. I call it. So it's, you know, you got to give a, 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 a voir dire, practice it, practice it with a focus group. It's the one thing that you can't rehearse in front of the mirror or by yourself but what you learn when you start doing lots of voir dires is that the same questions, the same issues, the same hurdles come up. And so you're not surprised and you're, you're, you're not as afraid uh, to pick a jury after you've practiced it. Um, and then the third, there's some other tricks. You know, we had Amy Cuddy, the great um, she's a New York Times bestselling author, come and give a presentation. It's on the website. If any of you guys who are listening to this want to hear it and you're a member. But uh, she did a whole presence. She wrote this great book called Presence. And in present, she talked about the physiological connection between our brain and our body and simple tools and tricks we can do to bring down anxiety. And these things work. It's actually based on science. We've got uh, Chris Stamba, who um, has studied a lot of this whole, uh, he's the one that first told me about Amy Cuddy and we invited her on and had her. But there's this incredible physiological thing that you can do or once you think about your bodies to control your state. Uh, and then there's some 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 sort of out there tricks uh, that we're going to include. Um, there's again, you don't have to believe it, but it works. There's uh, I went up and actually um, took a course taught by this great hypnotist named Mike Mandel. Mandel's mm -hmm. probably the leading 
hypnotist, certainly one of them living today. He was a student of Milton Erickson's, did a lot of uh, work with uh, Grendler and Bender on uh, neuro-linguistic programming. Anyway, he teaches a course up in Toronto uh, on how to become a certified hypnotist. So I went and took it. Not to, you know, you're going to enchant the jury because you're not. It doesn't work in the context of a of trying to influence other people. What you can do is steal some tools that have been around for decades on how to get your own anxiety under control, how to, so, you know, I wouldn't call it this, but self-hypnotize yourself into being in a better state, in a better place. So anyway, all these different tools are available. And I think it is, that's why when we talk about the five sort of spheres of yeah. mixed method advocacy, working on yourself is the most important. Because all the trial lawyers who try cases are brilliant. They, they got through law school. They passed the bar. They're all incredibly engaging personally, but a lot of us freeze up and get scared. And so our idea is that let's, let's teach pragmatic, practical ways to deal with this that you're going to have time to do that are relatively straightforward and are going to completely change your game when you got to get up and, and deliver your case. Yeah, it's it's what I'm doing. I've been doing a lot of work on the self and and I have a lot of fear and anxiety when I'm getting ready to try the case. But once I start, it's gone. Uh, well, when, let me rephrase that in the courtroom, it's gone. Now, at night, it comes back. Uh, right. But in the courtroom, it's gone. And and it's yeah. it's a combination. And I'm not trying to rub it in because I'm, I'm, I'm a Texas A&M grad. Uh, uh, but it's a combination of Zen Buddhism and Jimbo Fisher. Uh, and so oh, don't, don't, don't talk to me about Jimbo. I'm a <laughs> I'm sorry Jimbo. about that. And I, I, I'm not trying to rub it in. So the, you know, <laughs> Michael Luzerman has a, a Zen priest that he works with, uh, nice. and he's got this Zen workshop where you work on just being in the moment and just focusing on what you're doing and being hundred percent committed. And at the same time, I was hearing Jimbo on a press conference last night talking about, you know, you can't worry about the score. You have to worry about the person in front of you, you have to worry about making the play in front of you, blocking the person you need to block, and then the rest will take care of itself. Yeah. And it's just being in the moment, doing what you have to do. So when I'm, when I'm in a board dire, I, I can't be thinking about, is this a good juror or a bad juror? I don't take any notes. Someone else is taking notes. Now, someone else is scoring. Yeah, someone else is taking notes. I just am just interested in having a conversation with this person and hearing what they have to say. And it's a mindset. And you have to work real hard on that mindset. But it's just, you do. I'm, I'm thinking this is a good person and who wants to do what's right. Now, what they think is right might be different than what I think is right. Now, that's the issue that someone else is going to worry about when they when they evaluate our conversation. But I'm going to go in there with the mindset, this is a person who's here to do their duty, to do what they think is right. And I want to have a conversation because I'm interested in what they have to say. Thank you to everyone who attended Cowan's Big Rig Boot Camp in August. We had an excellent virtual turnout this year and are already thinking of how we can continue to raise that bar for next year. If you'd like to attend virtually in 2021, be sure to mark May 20th, 2021 on your calendar now and save the date. To stay updated with details as they become available, visit BigRigBootCamp.com and sign up for our mailing list. And now back to the show. You know, you have a, you have a huge advantage though over a lot of young lawyers. Is, you know, I, the analogy I have is a, you know, is, a, is a NASCAR race or a Formula One race where you're, you're, you're going to enter this race with professional drivers on the other side who are trying to take your ass out. They know yeah, the yeah. strategy. They've done it. You're, you know, you're going against Dale Earnhardt Jr. You know, at Daytona. And you're, you don't even know how to drive. <laughs> and so you're sitting there trying to remember, okay, push in the clutch and you know, pull out yeah. the gas and steer and all this stuff. And you're just consumed with the mechanics. And you're so scared versus, you know, a Michael Cowan who's been driving in races for decades. That's true. And you're not, you don't think about the clutch. You don't think about the gas. All you got to worry about is how you're going to cut Earnhardt's ass off, right? And so I think that one of the biggest solutions to fear is practice. I, I was about to say this, exactly. And, and we got a problem with, with our young lawyers because you know there are fewer cases going to trial. So how can you possibly get the practice? And that's where I, I call it batting practice for, you know, we have this program with trial school. It's virtual focus groups. We're really just getting it off the ground, but where you can get a panel on Zoom and practice your voir dire. And it's not the same as standing up, but it's pretty damn close. But I, I will tell you, I think that's important. And I think that we should all do that before we, and all. I, and I continue to do that. I, I do practice runs for a trial case. We bring in people, you know, we're not worried about representative samples and stuff anymore. We just bring in you right. know, 20 people and I just practice talking to them 
and then I leave the room and someone finds out, you know, what they thought about me, what, what they got, what they didn't get, what their questions were, uh, so I can get better. But for all the lawyers who say, oh, you can't get to trial, you can't get to trial, is are Allstate and State Farm making such great offers on these Cairo bill only cases uh, that that none of them can be tried? And is the five hundred or a thousand dollars that the client's going to get in their pocket so it's a life changing amount that we can't risk that money? I mean, if you're a young lawyer, you want to go to trial. I mean, go tell. I guarantee you, there are lots of law firms out there that don't really want to spend the time yep. to spend three days in trial where they might make fifteen hundred bucks in attorney's fees. Go say, well, I will try those. Can I try any of those cases for you? You can try cases. You just maybe right now it's harder right now because of COVID, but that's not going to last forever. You just have to be willing. And I found that in my own firm when I used to do auto, you know, regular car wrecks. I'd hire people that said they wanted to try cases, right? but magically all their clients wanted to settle. Well, Whereas because I have those cases, they didn't. It's frightening. It is. It's a scary thing. And so not only is it scary, but it's an ass load of work. It is. And so wait a minute. There's a scary really hard thing that I'm going to have to do, or I can just take the offer and talk my client into it. Right. How many times you have you heard, well, the client made me settle. The client wanted to settle. So and, you talk to the client. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if you want to be a trial lawyer, then get in there and get your scars and get bloodied up and go try some cases. And, and yeah. it's only, honestly, it's only by going in there and, and, you know, do it on the smaller cases where it's not life changing to your client, whether you want or lose. And, and go in there, and when you lose a couple times and you survive, that's how you get. That's right. To manage the fear, you don't get over it, but it becomes manageable uh, because well, you learn it's not that bad. You're not going to die. Your client's not going to die. And so, it's, you know, a lot of the most of the content in trial school has now become it's all online, but it's yes. designed to help alleviate the fear, also by knowing the best way to do it. You know, I, I think probably one of the most used pieces of paper in trial lawyer history is that one page in David Ball Damages where he gives the opening statement template, right? Yeah. So many people use that because it's easy. It's in the heat of battle when, you know, it's the, what I call the fog of war, right? You know, it is that weekend yeah. before you, you should have prepared three months ago, but you didn't. Now it's jamming. You can't do everything. And so the idea is, and now you're scared to death. And you don't remember how the seminar said to do it at the AAJ. So we're boiling this stuff down. And look, is it um, perfect? No, but it's best practices, best ways to do it from some of the best guys around the country. And there's a certain solace in being able to watch, you know, somebody like Bob Simon give a closing. You can watch it in 45 minutes, craft your closing off of that and feel like you're doing a pretty good job. And then hopefully – You've practiced with some focus groups or virtually through the trial school thing. And now you've got a little practice under your belt and you've, you've now got a little more confidence and a little less fear. And it's even David Ball. I mean, I was, I'm working with David on a case right now and I was talking to him last week and he says that, you know, he's doing some work with Nick Rowley and he's learning from Nick. He's learning from other people and, and opening his mind, you know, and David's a lot less dogmatic than, than uh, people say he is when you get to know him. Um, well, I, 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 I have uh that's good to hear. <laughs> yeah. I, I think he was getting more dogmatic with the reptile thing. I think since he and Keenan have split off, I think he's yeah. become a little less. No, I, I loved, I look, I, I, his book I, is required reading at my firm, but yeah. you know, I, I've heard, I mean, David, if you're listening to this, my apologies, but I've heard, you know, this is the only way to do it. You know, this is how people don't know. And I just disagree with that. I think there are multiple ways of doing things. And uh, I know we've learned nuggets that, you know, and, and best practices that candidly, I think, have moved the state of the art beyond where things were even five years ago. Well, with all respect, I don't want to criticize anyone in particular, but there's there's a marketing message of you have to come to me and you have to keep giving me your money. Of course. Uh, and uh, which uh, honestly, a lot of lawyers, not just consultants do. And then there's yeah. what you're doing, which is I want to get better. I'm going to share what I learned and I'm not asking for a dime for it. And I think that's really not only admirable, but that's kind of how we're going to get to the truth, because as long as there is that, you know, I either no one can no one else can really know all the secrets because they either need to keep paying me money because only I know or they need to refer refer the cases to me because only I know, um, you know, it's hard to get everything uh, full development. I think th what you're doing, which is, you know, here's what I know. I want to learn what you know. Let's share the best from everybody and try to make everyone better. It's just incredible. And it's just such an incredible time to be a plaintiff's lawyer. 
Well, I agree. And what's, what's great too, is because it's free, you have these amazing, you know, guys like Carl Douglas who are like, Hey man, I'm all about this. Cause it's free. You know, I taught the, uh, you know, uh, gosh, you name it. I mean, so it, it's because trial, trial school is completely free. I think we're having the doors open on a lot of really secret sauce methodology um, that yeah. I think is changing, you know, changing the game. Really and, you know, and the universe blesses you when you, I mean, like this podcast, I don't, I, I, you know, I don't charge any money for it. Uh, and I'm not doing it directly to get cases. I mean, I'm not specifically, and I'll, I'll be perfectly happy if someone sends a case over, but of course. that's not the, you know, it's, it's not a pure marketing thing. Right. But we're doing fine. I mean, um, of course. We, we do our boot camps, we do all kinds of stuff and we do that for free, but we're doing fine. Uh, you know, you don't, uh, it, when you share, it all comes back and all uh, comes back. for those of us, we'll have a link in the show notes, but for those people who want to check out trial school, get involved, what do they need to do? So if you are a plaintiff lawyer who only represents human beings and want to join, it's completely free. Visit trialschool.org. Uh, you need two references and just, if you have uh, friends or, or associates or whomever, you need two plaintiff lawyers to recommend you. Uh, fill out the application. We will then vet you. And hopefully within a day or two, you'll get your free membership. And then you've got access to not only all the live stream events, but the entire body of, of work that we have from all these great lawyers around the country that are on the trial school website. And it's easy. It's uh, set up on a, a platform called Ustream. You can pull it up on your phone, on your TV, you know, the night before when you're getting ready for your opening statement and it's all right there in an easy to use format. So please join uh, visit trialschool.org and just put in an application. It's, and it's, it's incredible stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm on there. And so, uh, and I really appreciate what you're doing. And Rich, I wish you every success going forward. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me. And I really look forward to seeing your book, man. And uh, once you come up for air after it's finished, we, we'd love for you to share. Absolutely. It with our, with our yeah, I, I will get more involved once once I get that done. I just I know that I'll get so into trial school that I won't ever finish the book. So. <laughs> All right, my friend. Well, thanks for having me. It's really been fun. Thank you for joining us on Trial Lawyer Nation. I hope you enjoyed our show. If you'd like to receive updates, insider information, and more from Trial Lawyer Nation, sign up for our mailing list at triallawyernation.com. You can also visit our episodes page on the website for show notes and direct links to any resources in this or any past episode. To help more attorneys find our podcast, please like, share, and subscribe to our podcast on any of our social media outlets. If you'd like access to exclusive, plaintiff lawyer-only content and live monthly discussions with me, send a request to join the Trial Lawyer Nation Insider Circle Facebook group. Thanks again for tuning in. I look forward to having you with us next time on Trial Lawyer Nation. Each year, the law firm of Cowan Rodriguez Peacock pays millions of dollars in co-counsel fees to attorneys nationwide on trucking and company vehicle cases. If you have a case involving death or catastrophic injuries and would like to partner with our firm, please contact us. We have experience finding potential defendants that other firms miss, and we've added millions of dollars to cases by finding these sources of recovery. If you have a catastrophic injury or death case where the policy limits appear to be insufficient, give us a call. If we can find another defendant, we can partner on the case. And if we can't, then we won't ask for any of the fees. You can reach Delacy Friday by calling 210-941-1301 or send an email to podcast at triallawyernation.com. She will coordinate a time for Michael Cowan to speak with you in person or by phone to discuss the case in detail. This podcast has been hosted by Michael Cowan and is not intended to, nor does it create the attorney-client privilege between our hosts, guests, or contributors and any listener for any reason. Content from the podcast is not to be interpreted as legal advice. All thoughts and opinions expressed herein are only those from which they came.